Good day from wherever you are. My name is Janine van Hoofd and I will be chairing today the session on evidence update on gastrointestinal bleeding management. It's a great honor to do that together with Rayan Hadri and Xu Tan. And actually moving on to the next slide, we have some formalities to share with you. And that's especially about this special offer ESGE is offering you. And if we continue, this is for my presentation. I will actually do just a short presentation on the reality of bleeding uh, where we are. So just a short fact check. So first, some of my disclosures. I hope at least I'm going to show them to you. Yes, here they are. I think everybody has nowadays. And then to start with the introduction, first of all, the incidence of hospitalization for upper GI bleed is 65 per 100,000. And the male female ratio is two to one. And I think we all realize in daily practice that this upper GI bleed is more common than the lower GI bleed. And that's also what the data are telling us. It's sixfold higher. And we also do see a change where in previous years, 50% would be peptic ulcer disease. Nowadays, that went down to 25, but it's still the most commonest cause of the upper GI bleed. And here you can actually appreciate I should go one slide back if possible. This is going a bit too quick as you can see. So in the slide before you could see what actually are the most common causes of uh, the upper GI bleed with the ulcer, the Jolafwa, um, the varicheal really at the top. And what I then want to tell you is that if um, the picture on the left of your screen is happening to your patient, the most important happening to you. And I think for that, it's important that you are aware of the data that are going to help you to treat your patient. So let me see if I'm going to manage to go to the next slide, which is still, it seems a bit hampering. So maybe they should take back the control of the slide in the back office and I will continue talking through it and also asking to move please to the next slide. Yes, I think this is important that you have this in mind. So at the moment, you have a bit of spare time, I would suggest you to check out this site and for the next mark, that will show you that the ESG com is going to help you. And if we put on the next marking, it will be around the guidelines. So the next one, please. And if you click on that one, it will help you further. And that's what you can appreciate over here. And with another click, you can clearly see what kind of different topics the ESG is showing you. So that's over here. And within the upper GI, you will find the following. So next slide, please. So here you can appreciate that we recently had two new guidelines, a very recent guideline on lower GI bleeds. And I first highlight a bit the one on upper GI bleeds. That's depicted over here. It's very important that the first thing you're going to do if you have an upper GI bleed is to go to check what kind of risk endoscopic stigmata are around. So depending on the type of stigmata, there is a treatment algorithm. And as you can appreciate over here, mostly the therapy will be uh, injection, thermo thermal, mechanical, or nowadays also topical. That is uh, applicable for the really sporting bleedings, but also if there is an adherent clot, try to remove the clot and then you will find what kind of lesion there's below and that's determining the kind of treatment you're going to give. And if you move on to the next slide, 
you will see that the same is applicable for the lower GI bleed. Depending on the lesion you will find, you can see what kind of treatment you should uh, be applying. Let's go to the next slide. And there is, of course, much more to tell exactly about the therapies. And today we will dive deeper into the mechanical and topical. And we will first of all have a lecture of Dr. Ray and from the London University. And thereafter, we have uh, the lecture from Xu Tang from the USA. And they are going to, to do the show must go on. I'm happy to give the floor to Dr. Hadry. Janine, thank you very much for the uh, introduction, <clears throat> but also a big thanks to the uh, ESGE, uh, but also to, to Cook Medical for, for sponsoring this event. And it's a real pleasure to be part of this um, webinar and educational series. So um, my name is Ryan Hadry. I work at uh, both University College Hospital and Cleveland Clinic in London, and I'm going to be talking to you about endoscopic hemostasis in the 21st century, um, but really focusing on the application of hemostatic powders. Um, this is a, 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 a slide that I've taken from a, another lecture, which I had to give a few weeks ago on, on what endoscopy or what upper GI endoscopy will look like in the 21st century. Um, we are spoilt when we go to, to any um, uh, online or, or, or hybrid Congress now with um, demonstrations and lectures on, on, on uh, imaging, um, on the, the, the new paradigm of really onco-endoscopy with resection that is um, uh, really delving into deeper layers of the, the gastrointestinal tract. Um, and, and we're now becoming endosurgeons with endoscopic treatments for not just uh, bariatric and obesity patients, but also acid reflux, and also beginning to explore um, the, the field of robotic endoscopy. But one thing that I still think is poorly uh, informed is hemostasis. Um, and I think that we're going to see a big change in the protocols and algorithms that Janine demonstrated, <clears throat> because there is now a lot of emphasis on, on hemostasis. And the fact that there's 1,200 people registered for this webinar um, really highlights that. So um, th this is really just to, to highlight what Janine said, you know, that you, every gastroenterologist or every uh, you know, upper endoscopist who, who has an on-call system, this is a common medical emergency and the mortality from this is still not insignificant. Um, there has been a, a bit of a shift in, 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 in the etiology and we know that peptic ulcers remain the most common cause of um, uh, presentation to the ED or also patients who are in the hospital. And, and despite the massive uh, improvements and advances that I've shown you in therapeutic endoscopy and our own endoscopic skills, there is still a huge variability uh, in the outcome of these patients and remains a challenge for pa patients, but also for endoscopists around the globe. And endoscopic therapy still remains gold standard, whether that is with <clears throat> endoscopic uh, mechanical therapy, whether it's with uh, sclerotherapy with injection therapy with epinephrine and adrenaline, um, but also heat-based modalities um, such as heat probe, gold probe, APC, but also things like YAG laser. And we'll see in the next lecture the massive advances in, in, in mechanical therapy with endoscopic clips. And the recommendation, the recommendation still to this day, which has not changed over decades of societal guidance, is that um, we have to use combination therapy, and they are, uh, they are few, but they are randomized data and meta-analysis that suggest that this combination treatment has some superior uh, outcome than, than monotherapy uh, on its own. So these are the, the guidelines that were demonstrated or shown in the uh, earlier part of this webinar, which uh, stipulates the combination therapy should be uh, the, the bare minimum the, these patients use. But it's also very interesting that in the most recent um, uh, ESGE guidelines, there is a separate paragraph that uh, says that the limitations of topical powders and sprays uh, are that they only bind to sites with active bleeding and perhaps wash away within 24 hours. And therefore, they're a temporary measure and their recommended use on a regular basis is still not mandated. 
if we look at the uh, ACG guidelines, uh, so we go across the pond to the United States, sorry, my slides are just um, uh, misbehaving slightly, there is a recommendation in the ACG guidelines where they suggest an endoscopic hemostatic therapy. Uh, and in this case, they have named the hemostatic powder spray, which is TC325, which we all uh, know and love as hemospray. Uh, with patients with actively bleeding ulcers. It, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a conditional recommendation, but it's based on low quality evidence. If we uh, look at this, this is a historic uh, position statement led by uh, a, 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 a colleague uh, and a real expert in the field of uh, GI bleeding, Alan Barkin, in patients with actively bleeding ulcers, we suggest against using topical powder as a single therapeutic strategy versus conventional endoscopic uh, dual or tri-therapy. So what do hemostatic powders in the 21st century look like? Um, they're, they're, they're all based on different active ingredients. I'm gonna focus my lecture on, on, on what I've used uh, most, which is hemospray. Uh, I've had the, the privilege of working uh, with a lot of people in, 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 in not just in cook endoscopy, but also colleagues around the world to, to put together our international registry. But there are now other powders that, that do uh, or suggest that they do the same thing. There is Next Powder by Medtronic and there are various other things like Puristat, et cetera, that are topical agents that can be delivered for GI bleeding. So what is the data? You know, what is the data on the use of these hemostatic powders? Now, uh, we lack robust, well-powered randomized control trials on the use of topical powders. We also lack randomized control trials on a lot of the other modalities that we use. GI bleeding is not an easy subject uh, or a, a study to design a randomized control trial. Um, this was our first output from the International Registry uh, with colleagues uh, in Australia, in the US, in Europe. Um, so consecutive patients presenting to 12 uh, high volume tertiary centers uh, with acute upper GI bleeding. So Forest 1A, uh, uh, 1B, 2A with active stigmata of bleeding and hemostasis was just under 90% with a re-bleeding of 10.3%. So this uh, was hemospray used either in, in combination therapy uh, or as monotherapy or as, um, as rescue therapy in patients who had um, uh, had an unsuccessful outcome with initial hemostatic intervention. Now, if you just look at this slide, for those of you that look uh, at, 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 at micro data, the, the Rockel and Blatchford score in this cohort of patients is high, 11 and 14 respectively. These are sick comorbid patients who um, you know, want to exhibit a poor outcome. Um, so high risk patients and a good outcome. So you know, encouraging preliminary data on the use of hemospray. If we look at the re-bleeding rates, I mentioned just over 10%, and seven and 30 day mortality, sorry, 11 and 20% respectively, just to highlight these are high risk patients, a Blatchford of 14. So these are comorbid patients with ischemic heart disease, possibly with cancer on anticoagulants. Um, the, if, we, if we look at the subgroup analysis in these patients, these are now patients who um, have uh, had um, uh, 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 acute GI bleeding undergoing endoscopic treatment with hemospray. Um, you can see in, in 118 patients, ladies and gentlemen, it was used as monotherapy with a very, very good hemostasis rate of 92%, not statistically significant when used in combination or rescue therapy. So already we can see that there are certain scenarios where GI bleeding can be treated with monotherapy, perhaps moving away from that paradigm of dual or triple therapy. We, we've then looked at this because I, I really feel quite passionate about the fact that we, we might be over-treating patients with, with, with with lots of um, uh, you know, uh, different modalities of treatment. Um, and so we're now beginning to look at the use of these powders in, in bespoke situations where we may be able to use them as monotherapy. On the left, hemospray. Uh, on the right, uh, a newer version, uh, something called Next Powder. They pretty much do the same thing, but the data on hemospray is robust. So this was published um, uh, just a few months ago uh, uh, by one of our fellows, 
And again, this is exploring the use of heme spray as monotherapy. And ladies and gentlemen, you can see that in the majority of patients uh, that had peptic ulcers, the hemostasis rates were very good, 90%. Again, uh, an acceptable Rockle score, uh, a, 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 a rebleed rate that is a little bit higher of 16%, fair enough. Uh, but these, again, were slightly high risk uh, patients. If we look at the other uh, indications for considering the use of these topical agents and hemosprays, monotherapy, cancer. These patients do not present to your ED with an acute GI bleed. They present with symptomatic anemia, uh, with transfusion dependency of red cells or blood products. And uh, although the hemostasis rates are 100%, I will show you in a more recent publication that we can significantly impact the quality of life of these patients. And then again, you can see post endoscopic therapy, and we're not going to focus on lower GI bleeding in this series uh, that follows next week. Um, so just moving on to the uh, next uh, slide, I've, I've touched on that. So um, we we, you, all of you in the audience are getting uh, uh, more and more uh, adventurous uh, in your endoscopic therapeutic skills. Uh, you are treating high-risk lesions. You're going deeper into the submucosa where there are vessels. And so intraprocedural bleeding is not uncommon. Uh, intraprocedural, so during endoscopic therapy. Uh, this was published in UEG Journal 2020, so uh, uh, 18 months ago excuse me, uh, in patients undergoing a, a variety of endoscopic uh, therapies who had acute bleeding and there was 100% immediate hemostasis, re-bleed rate very, very low. So, you know, an adjunct for those of you who are um, uh, treating these patients. Uh, so <clears throat> this is uh, a slightly historical slide. This manuscript is not in submission. It has been accepted. It is on PubMed. Again, uh, published by one of our, our fellows, uh, a multi-center uh, uh, prospective study of consecutive patients from our international database, so patients from the US, Australia, Europe, um, 105 patients with uh, uh, upper GI cancers. Um, now, the, 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 the primary outcome for all of these GI bleeding studies is always uh, hemostasis, not in this cohort, ladies and gentlemen, because actually what you want to show is that you're reducing the transfusion burden. This is a, a pilot randomized control trial. It was empowered to show a, uh, you know, an effect. Again, looking at the same uh, outcome again from Alan Barkin's group, hemostasis rate of 90%. But actually what we want to see in these patients is not so much the, um, the, the, the hemostasis rates. We want to see a reduction in transfusion requirements. Um, at the recently concluded uh, UEG, uh, we presented uh, our most recent data. And what we did is we are now comparing the outcomes of these patients um, uh, in, 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 in the years since we started using hemospray to see whether we have improved our uh, use of the, the, the hemospray, either as monotherapy or either as an adjunct to our other uh, endoscopic uh, modalities. And, and, and looked at the outcomes um, uh, uh, previous to 2018 and after 2018. Um, and, and we can see here that there is a, an improvement uh, that is uh, just uh, falls uh, below statistical significance in, in, in hemostasis rates. Um, but actually, when we look at the seven and 30 day mortality, uh, there is a difference. So we are getting smarter at selecting patients who would benefit from, from endoscopic treatment um, with, with hemospray. So finally, I'm gonna to touch on, on, on GI bleeding. This is, has been accepted in, in gas, uh, Journal of, of Gastro and Hepatology. Um, these are really difficult patients, guys. We, we all have them. Uh, they do not present to the ED with hemodynamic compromise. They will be referred through by your oncologist with that hemoglobin that they just can't keep on top of with uh, transfusion uh, requirements that are significant and impact on their already altered quality of life. Now, radiotherapy is not always an option. And so can the application of topical powders such as heme spray influence the outcome of these patients? And the answer is yes. I've shown you that actually um, uh, the, the, the hemostasis rates are close to 100%. Um, 
96% uh, in this series, but this is the, the take home slide for me. You can see that the change in blood units uh, that these patients have before and after the application of heme spray, you know, statistically significant a change uh, in blood units, which for these patients who have cancer um, have uh, a, a, you know, poor outcome anyway, this plays an important part on their quality of life, but also there probably are some cost effective metrics here. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you so much for, for your time. Um, you know, the, the, my, 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 my concluding thoughts are that, you know, acute GI bleeding is, 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 is a big uh, problem and there's still an unmet need. Um, you know, combination therapy is advocated for high risk lesions, but I challenge you that in the 21st century, we will begin to see a shift away from that. These topical therapies will evolve our uh, ability to treat these lesions will in, in improve. Uh, and and other, aside, aside from peptic ulcer disease, cancer, post endotherapy, um, you know, monotherapy may well become first line in the 21st century. Uh, thank you very much for your, for your time. Thank you, uh, Ray, and a very, uh, very nice overview. And I'm really impressed about the data that are starting to be around on this uh, treatment and also what you and your group did, uh, getting more and more evidence that it's holding a bit longer than we might have thought in the beginning. Big thanks for that. Um, I would like to keep the question of the Q&A for after the other lecture. So uh, big thanks and like to continue and introduce Xu Tang, who is Director of Therapeutic Endoscopy and Endoscopic Research and Professor of Medicine for the Division of Digestive uh, Diseases at the University in Mississippi in the USA. And I'm really looking forward to his talk about clip in a time. So it might be a bit more about mechanical. Thank you, Ginny, and thank you, David, ESG, and Cook Medical to give us a, a time to discuss about clip in time. So this slide outlined the evolution of endos endoscopic hemostasis. Like Rohan mentioned, endoscopic endo hemostasis always be the cornerstone of every endoscopist. And so 30, 40 years ago, people started with uh, injecting uh, epinephrine, a solution to stop bleed. And then heater probe, monopolar probe, bilopolar probe become available. So I was trained 20 years ago in endoscopy. And that time we use the heater probe and bipolar. Monopolar probe proven to be uh, causing a lot of complications. So pretty much a lot of places we still provide heater probe and monopolar probe as a treatment options. And now we have a band light here. Right now it's focused mostly on their seal bleed. Although there are public studies using band ligator to, uh, to treat a dual lesion or even ulcer lesion. And endoclips and APC and probes pretty much focus on radiation proctitis or ADM. And then Rehan gave a very excellent review on hemospray. That's the latest I'm preparing. So let's talk about the through the scope endoscopic device. So not, uh, so, uh, not talk about the ovescope. Or old school. Is Professor Hayashi, a German, uh, is a Japanese endoscopist, published, uh, actually invented this and reported it in the Japanese uh, journal in 1975. And it's Olympus company who uh, brought this to market in the uh, mid 90s, but it's reloadable. I used this 20 years ago in Canada uh, during training, and it, it takes times. Um, and also you need the expertise, but nothing from yourself, also from your assistant to load the clip. So clipping device did not take off in the West until companies start to uh, making and marketing disposable one-time use. So user-friendly. Uh, so the Olympus, uh, Boston Scientific, even Cook Medical. And this is a 2002, 2003, but none of them uh, have a combination uh, i.e. they can be rotated or reopen, uh, have a reopen capability at the same time. So it's really in 2011, Cook Medical come out with an instant clip. It's the first clip that combine a rotatability and reopening ability. And it's also a first clip to give you an offer that the 60 millimeter opening span. I fully embrace this clip because it's, uh, you can really grab the tissue and penetrate the base and 
uh, help me with a lot of chemostasis and uh, for closure. So this year, and Cook Medical came out with a second generation uh, of insulin plus, insulin plus. Uh, I believe is also relief, uh, released in the Europe. Uh, it's available in the States almost a year. So since uh, for the past 20 years, uh, 10 to 15 years, we know there's exponential growth of uh, clip application uh, in GI endoscopy, mostly for hemostasis. So clips not can provide hemostasis and also provide tissue approximation and stand or feeding tube anchoring. This case I did it in January this year. It's a spurting bleed in the stomach after EMR. You see, I use a monotherapy. I close it, I hold it, and wanna make sure it's no more bleeding before I ask my nurse to deploy. I placed another clip just for safety. So I uh, Reha mentioned some guidelines that we need to use combination therapy, and I would like to show some evidence. I've been using clip monotherapy to treat the variety of female uh, conditions with good result. So what are you looking for among different clipping devices? So we need a clip that is strong, and we also need a clip that's agile, that you can reopen, close, rotate uh, precisely. And uh, when instant clip become available in 2011, and we did an independent study uh, at the University of Mississippi. We compare instant clip resolution, uh, not 360, old resolution clip, and Olympus Quick Clip 2. We demonstrated instant clip give you the strongest closing and opening force. The top study was published. Uh, I think uh, in 19, 2000, 2014 by John Hopkins, they use a peak model to look at the clip, clip retention. We know that in the past, Boston Scientific Resolution Clip have the highest retention rate. And in this study, the instant clip actually give the highest uh, retention rate after application. And actually, if you don't want uh, uh, the clip in place during follow-up endoscopy, it's very easy to remove the clip just using a stair. And another study uh, published by Doc Rex, the colonoscopy in the US in 2017, GIE, showed after colon EMR, the instant clip is more, more um, twice likely to retain compared to old um, Boston Scientific uh, clips. So this uh, paper was published two years ago in GIE from Harvard Group. So several years ago, Boston came out with a resolution 360. And also we know there's a Chinese uh, microtech clip become available in certain parts of the world. And so they compare the uh, instant, instant clip, resolution 360 and microtech clip. The show resolution 360 rotated fastest, but microtech clips are better in, in opening and control. And the rotation wise, resolution clip, microtech clip are better. But instant clip still was the strongest clip in closure in strength. So mechanically, instant clips still the strongest. So this year, uh, Cook Medical unleashed the instant plus, fully addressed the uh, motility, uh, agility issue. This clip open up to 60 millimeter, like the old instant clips, and it can open instantly on any fun configuration. And, and also you can rotate much better than older generation. I've been using this for a year. And I must say, I haven't used other company clips in the past several years. With Instant Plus, I'm very uh, satisfied. I, uh, I cannot ask more. I think uh, if you ask me any other improvement, I'm very satisfied with Instant Plus. So let's look at about the clip, using clip to treat a hemostasis. This study actually published by GIE uh, almost 13, 14 years ago by my friend, Dr. Raji. And it's a review, it's a uh, technical review. It showed that using clip 
uh, to provide hemostasis, it's as good or better compared to injection um, burning coagulation with a uh, less rebleeding risk, 15% uh, versus 24%. And early on, Rian mentioned about uh, you know combination therapy in hemostasis. Actually, I have been do using clip monotherapy for all situations, including active bleeding visible vessel with good result. This is a study, actually, a randomized study actually, show this is older generation clip. We know the older generation clip, they're less strong, less agile, right? Even though with the older generation endoclips, we can see the uh, if you just clip. Injection, we should never use injection alone, okay? And injection and clip combination. Primary hemostasis, 98. And injection actually give you com um, potential complication. Rebleeding rate. Clip monotherapy, 2.4. Injection, high, expected, 14%. Injection clip, 10%. You may ask why. The reason is when you inject, Either it's epinephrine causing visual constriction or it's a volume causing mechanical tamponade. That effect will go off, uh, will resolve in a few minutes. So you, you inject it, you stop the bleeding. When you apply clip, you don't know whether you got the vessel or not. Like I showed you in the earlier video, I click it, I hold, I want to see the bleeding stop before I deploy. I know I got the vessel. So that's why I, I've been practicing um, clip monotherapy. It can give you a quick application. Some bleeding situation, if you don't act quickly, you're waiting for that epinephrine to get ready. You lose the endoscopic view, and you may have to apply suction, intubation, anything. You want to be quick, effective, and cheap. You don't have you, you save injection needle. So when is the clip a good hemostatic solution? This is my personal uh, opinion. It's not from any guideline. I think it's a visible vessel, active bleeding vessel, monotherapy, and, uh, and also bleeding lesion within the mucosal defect, such as after EMR, after ESD, uh, post polypectomy, fistula leaks. And uh, if you also, uh, if you fail with other methods, of course, come out with a clipping device. And also anatomic weak location, such as colon or small bowel diverticular bleeding, sickle or small bowel pathology. And also refractory post symphonic bleeding. And I've been doing ERCT for 20 years. In the first 20 years, every year uh, I send a one to two patient to the IR because after several sessions, those patients generally uh, cirrhotic on hemodialysis, the plated coagulation, not, 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 not perfect, that tends to bleed. With clipping, uh, you carefully clip the cut side, not on the opening of the uh, ducts. And I haven't, past 10 years, I've not seen the send a single patient to IR to stop the bleed. You can may also apply hemospray. People have studied, show this. Uh, hemospray work for post post And also, you don't even have a good view to stop bleed. Because sometimes if you use a thermal coagulation, you need a view. And I think a, a clipping and, a, and also the hemospray, you don't have a, you don't need a perfect view to to apply hemostasis. And also fresh anastomotic stomal bleeding. I will show you a case. The, the surgeon had been calling me the same day or second day after surgery, cold, uh, stomal uh, anastomosis bleeding. The previous guideline surgery is repeat surgery. That's very invasive. And also I do zenker diverticulotomy. Uh, large zenker, I like to put two clips one on each side after cut. So this is traditional bleeding first. Malarial rice tear, post uh, EDL ulcer bleeding, and ulcer bleeding, dual avoid this. Uh, I think uh, when I finished my training, I was doing uh, injection thermal, uh, not less of APC. And for the past uh, 10 years, I pretty much gradually moved use exclusively equipment. And vessel of large caliber, diverticular bleeding, post EVL bleeding, and uh, refractory sphincter bleeding. When the uh, view is suboptimal, I use uh, start with clipping. I recommend. You may ask you, uh, is it 
and using too much clips. It's cost effective. And I think with the newer generation of new clips, we can control better, uh, less malfunction, and we use less clip per case. But we're using more clips, more clips due to we have an expanded indication application, and they are good outcomes. And also think about the time. I, I you save us uh, at least ten minutes to setting up the coagulation machine uh, to also save a needle to save the if, if an active bleeding developed after a therapeutic endoscopy within half a minute I can stop the bleeding. So this case was actually uh, last week, and the patient uh, underwent the EDL just routine EDL. Uh, 11 days ago, I doubt the patient was taking uh, PPI, so develop bleeding. You can see there's a uh, either a visible vessel or res residual uh, uh, barracks at the margin. And the first, I like to put a clip because I don't know which direction of blood flow. So I put a clip on top of it, didn't bleed. I put a clip below on top of it, and you can see a spurt of blood. And uh, so I've been using clips to treat a post you see this is a culprit show that's a culprit and uh, nobody after uh, uh, clipping and uh, i use uh, uh, clips to uh, uh, to treat a post ed or banding and in the past uh, i've been using a, a, a scleral therapy or repeat banding or not good result because those are the anatomic weak position already have ulceration difficult to burn And this is a, a, a case I did last year. Patient had a one to two centimeter squamous dysplasia, high grade, or you can call it uh, cancer in, uh, if you're in Asia. And I used duet. I performed MN um, mucosectomy. You can see very clean, but the margin start to ooze. And uh, you can use the tip of the snare, or I think the safer just to use one clip. I like to use the hood. The hood is actually from a crook bander device, six shooter. I recycle them after band them. Uh, band, I, I, so this gives me a, a very good endoscopic view. I can turn in the mucosa to the unfarsed location. And also when you esophagus, can, I can limit how much uh, clip opening. Uh, so the wider clip allow you to control the opening span. This is a case I did about a month ago, young patient start having bleeding, significant bleeding. And I found that this nodule or mass, I wasn't sure this is hemophilia from the ampulla or, so I, I started with the ERCP scope and uh, you can see in a moment, it's a spurting bleeding. It's a spurting bleeding. So I, I, I doubt this is a variceal bleeding. The patient otherwise healthy, no liver issue. This is the ampulla. So it's not a hemophilia. And I think this is some mucosal tumor. And that time I need to stop bleeding. You can use hemospray, but I like clips because I can open the clip and apply it within a minute and it's cheap. So I use a, this, I'm using a duodenoscope. You can see the Instant Plus works very well with the duodenoscope. You, of course, you don't want to use elevator too much. I generally fully open the elevator, get a clip out and gently press the elevator and then you can see the clip and it rotated very well. And uh, you can rotate open very well with elevator even half on. So you can see immediate hemostasis. Subsequently, I turn around, I did a US. You can see this is actually a gist, but it's very vascular, full of small arteries. Uh, if you use thermal coagulation, you're probably going to cause more bleed. You're going to open up more vessel around. And this is the case I did uh, about uh, two months ago. Patient had a surgery the day before and either chronic stoma anastomosis and overnight just bleeding, bleeding, uh, requiring transfusion nonstop. So the surgeon said, please, I went in, you saw the stoma, fresh bleeding, active bleeding. So if you use a thermal coagulation and you potentially disrupt the stoma because one day old, right? And uh, you can use a chemo spray, but this case, I, 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 I changed to gastroscope. So I can do a retroflex, see this better. You can see the scope is fully retroflexed with a cap on. And of course, because the fully retroflex, take a, a few seconds to open the instant plus, but open that very well. It can rotate very well. I apply two clips, stop the uh, bleeding, close the stoma.
And this is a case of post uh, uh, precardial spinal bleeding. And I mentioned earlier, and this is an instant plus or instant clips, works very well with a uh, uh, duodenal scope with elevator half arm. Uh, so I found the bleeding site, I close it, stop bleeding. This is, I'm sorry, let's go back. This is the last slide. And this patient had a partial gastrectomy and we can see a jejunal gastrojejunostomy, a big chronic ulcer, and there was a big vessel. It's probably four to five millimeter. That time I, I was debating, should I clip it? I decided not because of the size of the bleeding and the chronicity of the ulcer. Because if I, if I miss it, it's gonna be a, a, a disaster. So I will lose endoscopic view. So I clip next to it on the margin because I want to put you clip you provide a, a guide to the IR, really, uh, interventional radiologist. It turns out to be this vessel is close to the splenic artery takeoff. And so that embolizes this, the patient did well, and uh, we didn't cause any disaster. Thank you. That's my end of my talk. Thank you, uh, colleague Xu, for this very nice overview of the clipping. And it's, it's, it it's really astonishing what you all can clip in some seconds just with one clip. Uh, some of us might need a bit more uh, exposure to get also to this level. But having said that, I would like to ask everybody to please come forward with questions. We do have some already in the Q&A, but the more the better. And uh, I'm just going to throw some of the questions to either Shu or uh, Rayan. And I would like to start with one about, you just showed the clip on the gist shoe, and the person is asking why not to use a loop. Did you consider? Yeah. So <clears throat> that's also a, a good option. And uh, you can uh, loop it. But my concern that time, uh, if I loop it, I, I can strangulate. And I may stop the bleeding, but I may cause a, a big ulceration. And uh, this is a patient clearly needs surgery. And uh, we don't even know, I actually that day I performed FNA and all I got returns blood, blood, no tissue. I start, I use a Procore needle, 20 gauge. Uh, I started 10 times, just blood, blood because it's so vascular. So I think uh, it's, it, I measured about the three centimeter. And uh, if you use endo loop, you're probably gonna cause a, a, a big ulceration and the medial side wall. I don't know if it can cause perforation or more bleed. So at that time, I think uh, all I want to do is uh, stop the bleeding, I buy time, optimize the patient for surgery. Thank you, thanks for the answer. Ray, and there are also some out for you, especially I think you did lots of research in the upper, but is it also by now uh, applicable to use the Hamo spray in lower GI bleed? I think it's at least available. It's, you, you can give it for it, but are there data and what are the indications? Uh, thanks, Janine. So, so it is, it's absolutely licensed now. Uh, you know, our conscience should be absolutely clear when we're using it, that we're not doing something illegal. Um, it is uh, licensed for use in, in Europe and the United Kingdom. Um, we, we have some preliminary data on this that, that will be presented at DZW, but um, as you know from the guidelines that you presented, the, the role of, of primary endoscopy in lower GI bleeding is, um, you know, it's very difficult. And, you know, it is um, not something that, that, you know, we would advocate. So it, it's more really for semi-elective bleeding. So these are things like diverticular bleeds, post-endotherapy bleeds, or post-polypectomy bleeds. Um, uh, there was a little bit of preliminary data some years ago about use it, using it in radiation proctopathy. It didn't work. Um, but, you know, what, what a good thing to have on your shelf if you're doing a large piecemeal polypectomy or an ESD uh, in the colorectum and you have a, you know, a, a red out uh, that, you know, you, you know, you don't want to put a clip on. Um, you can you can put your topical powder on. You can identify where the bleeding is coming from. You can use coagulation forceps to to to, to uh, control the bleeding, wash off the powder, and complete your resection. So, yeah, it's there to be used. 
Thank you. And uh, there's another question for you uh, regarding the cancer. If you use hemo spray in a patient that has a malignant lesion to stop the bleeding, do you repeat it? Uh, how often can you do it? Do you do that electively or what is your algorithm? Yeah, that's a big question. Th there is no algorithm here. These patients don't fit into, into as, as, as you um, and Shu know the, these cancer patients don't present in a nice neat box of, um, you know, uh, uh, I'm having bleeding or I've got low platelets or I've got a hemoglobin of, of, of six. They will present often with, you know, multimodal presentations. <clears throat> so the aim here really is, is, is not to stop the acute bleeding, is to stop them having transfusions. And as you know, our data showed that you can prolong the period between transfusions. And so, so I think the answer there is, you know, we, we, we like to run our patients with a hemoglobin of 80. Um, and, you know, that's the sort of threshold that we engage with our oncologists. So as soon as that number begins to go south, we bring them back and we give them another therapy. But obviously working very closely with the onco-radiologists, radiotherapists, that these patients need radiotherapy to, to give them some definitive hemostasis. Thanks, very clear answer. There is also one about the clips. How do they compare, compare to the OVESCO? Okay. So I also have been using OVESCO for about probably uh, five to uh, six years. The, uh, when you use OVESCO, I reserve it for if I fail with regular clipping device. Because regular, if you use the just regular through the scope clipping device, and you don't, you don't have to change scope, you don't have to load everything, you're right there, you stop the bleeding. And uh, I must say, there's probably only cases in a year uh, I could not stop it. And then uh, if it fail, if it's an indication for VESCO, I would use a VESCO. But vast majority of them, I think it was a regular clipping device. And uh, if you, and also applying clip, it's not just applying clips. I think we need to, uh, you know, learn the uh, geometry, use common sense, try to approach, apply a clip at an angle. You, you, you try to get the, uh, the deep vessel and uh, it's not just put a bunch of clips. And uh, I also, a lot of time I, apply, I prefer to apply two clips. They are the angle. So in case there's a, a vessel direction um, change or we cannot see beyond the, beyond the surface, uh, it can still uh, provide an effective lasting effect. Uh, so in the past, uh, I would say three years, there was only one case that uh, I feel uh, I, I tried twice, clipping, regular clipping, didn't stop, and uh, I had to use Ovesco and stop it. So uh, very uncommon, and the Ovesco, I don't know about the, in Europe, it's a uh, 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 cost of several hundred dollars, and uh, much expensive than the, through the scope clipping device, and you need to you know, take time, you probably need to send somebody to your lab, get a scope, get a clip. And uh, so uh, uh, with the uh, uh, efficacy that regular clipping provided with me, I'm very happy with regular clipping. Thank you. There are also some questions about doing a re-endoscopy after a bleeding. Um, what's the reason behind the three days? I think that's actually in the guidelines that is stating that there is no fixed reason to do re-endoscopy within three days. It basically depends on the type of the lesions. If it's really a high risk lesion and you're unsure, you might consider to do a, a relook. And there is a specific re uh, question regarding re-endoscopy for hemospray. So Rayan, do you do standardized relooks or what is your algorithm there? Um, so, so, so I have a few comments there. You're absolutely right. That, that 72 hour cutoff that we've used over the last two decades for all our data, it, it's kind of been handed down from generation to generation. And I think we've cut and pasted that in all of our societal guidelines. Um, but, you know, so, so, so that's the first thing to say. And the, the, the second thing to say is that, no, you're, you, you have to have confidence in your first endoscopy. And if you don't, that's when you need to be honest enough to say, look, I think when the sun rises tomorrow morning, I'd like to do another endoscopy in my department with my nurses, just to make sure that I haven't undertreated this patient. The, the role for hemospray and then an, an, another relook endoscopy is, is really interesting if we move away from peptic ulcers and we move into the var varicele space. Because 
um, there, there is randomized control trial data from, 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 from Belgium and Egypt uh, in, 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 in gut, uh, I think it was last year, in, in patients with primary portal hypertensive uh, uh, esophageal, variceal bleeding and portal hypertensive gastropathy, where often, as you know, uh, Janine, these patients will present in the dead of night. Uh, you may not have the endoscopic skills to carry out band ligation or sclerotherapy or indeed tips. And they demonstrated the use of hemospray almost as a triaging and a holding measure before uh, expert intervention 24 hours later would then cause definitive hemostasis. So, so a roundabout way, that's, that's, a, that's, a, a, that's where you have a relook endoscopy in varices. Yeah, that's with that you do answer lots of questions because there were tons of questions out on what to do with the varices and also with the, the hypertension. So uh, that's really, uh, really nice. There is another one, what to do with angiodysplasia. Uh, angiodysplasia, I think I briefly mentioned in the slide in the evolution of endoscopic technique. And I think, uh, I don't know about Europe, in the, in the United States, AVM, it's a, a probably standard practice, use APC. And, uh, but uh, if you are doing a travel case, you don't have an APC machine in the lab, or if you are, um, you know, old timers, and I think a bipolar coagulation is fine. And uh, so uh, I trained uh, with bipolar for, to treat angiodysplasia with good result. I haven't caused any perforation. And, but there's a learning curve because you need to apply gentle pressure, you need to know the setting and the APC, you know, non-contact or gentle contact, very safe. So I think uh, in, the, in the States, I know that uh, at least uh, using uh, RB APC is a standard choice uh, to approach to manage uh, angiolites, basically. Sometimes using hemospray, right? Um, I, I, no, the answer is no, because I, I think with all bleeding lesions, you know, like, like we, we're so diligent in, 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 in onco-endoscopy about defining the morphology of a lesion before deciding on what treatment it is, you know, whether it's a raised lesion or a, or a depressed lesion. The same needs to apply to GI bleeding. You know, we have the forest classification, but when you understand the pathophysiology of angiodysplasia and tel telangiectasia, these are superficial capillaries that are coming off those, um, they're, you know, they're like IPCLs that we see in the esophagus. They're, they're coming off those, um, submucosal veins and arteries. And so hemospray will, will not work for two reasons. One, you need active bleeding for hemospray to work, but the, the pathophysiology and anatomy of angiodysplasia, as, as Shu said, it needs thermal coagulation because there's superficial lesions. Actually, I'd like to uh, further comment on the uh, angiodysplasia. So I start with APC, but in, if in the colon or small bowel, you burn, burn, still bleeding. And, uh, and then you're running a, a risk of causing perforation uh, if you burn more. So in that case, after several sessions, I started using clip. I will put a clip to close the margin. Hopefully that uh, uh, will stop bleeding. And if it's still bleeding, another option is just you grab a snare and uh, grab the tail of the, uh, the, the clip, apply a gentle a thermal, just a coagulation uh, setting. And uh, so the heat, uh, electricity will generate heat at the clip end and the further stop bleeding. So you, uh, you approximate the treated tissue, minimize the risk of perforation, and you stop bleeding. So thanks for this uh, addition. Yeah, questions are coming in relatively quickly, which I think it's good. There's lots of interaction. There's a question about the hemospray and cave. Is there a possibility to apply it for that indication? Um, so uh, the answer is I'm not aware of any data, um, and and I come back to, to the, the the questioner with you know what's the pathophysiology of gave what's the anatomy, you know these are superficial, uh, you know these are uh, neo vessels that are formed in the context of either chronic liver disease, chronic kidney disease, uh, rheumatological diseases. So these need uh, to have either. Uh, coagulation therapy, band ligation works very well. We published some data on radiofrequency ablation, but no, we, we, we've not really used hemospray in that space. And I, I'm not aware of any perspective or retrospective data. Uh, and there's another one that's for you both again. What about clipping after a pre-cut 
uh, bleeding or are we going to use hemospray? Shoo, please. So bleeding after clipping. Nay, bleeding after you did a pre-cut. Okay. So <clears throat> if immediately after the pre-cut uh, bleeding and uh, you, I think the treatment of choice, just injection some, uh, inject some epinephrine. I will stop uh, vast majority of bleeding. It is temporary bleeding. Actually, if you look at the uh, definition of uh, uh, the post pre-cut or skin primary bleeding, procedure of bleeding is not even considered uh, losing. So that stop during the procedure, a complication of the procedure. And we really talk about the after the procedure, patient return with either gross GI bleeding or re require transfusion. So for that, uh, I think it, if it's just lose a little bit, you can start with bipolar and uh, to kind of treat the bleeding spot. And uh, after one or two, I think I'm, right now I would use a clip. And of course, you have to uh, identify the uh, pancreatic duct opening, bile duct opening, not to clip in the middle, midline. And you know the bleeding is from the two sides. You want to clip the uh, oozing side uh, away from the opening. So they are actually, I think, uh, from Canada, they presented the uh, uh, cases that uh, post synchronically bleeding hemospray worked. I will leave actually a real expert, Rehan, to comment on hemospray. Um, yeah, look, I, the, there was always a, a, a slight reticence about using hemospray, you know, in, in, in the hepatobiliary space, you know, after a pre-cut because of, you, you just didn't know what that powder was going to do once it got up, got, got into, you know, the pancreatic duct or, or further downstream. Um, so I, I have to say that, um, I, I don't, do ERCP anymore, but uh, but I, I think mechanical therapy for these bleeds is is, is attractive. Um, but I think that as some of my colleagues have done early, and then using hemospray just to make sure that you are not contaminating the the you know the hepatobiliary ducts is is sensible. Thank you both for your really well-balanced uh, answer. There is another question about the hemospray. Is it the last choice during the emergency bleeding? No, I, I, I really don't think so. You know, that, I think that's what we, we used to think of it as, a, you know, when, when everything else is, um, is, is run out, then you spray a bit of hemospray and, you know, you, 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 you say some Hail Marys. Absolutely not. Um, we... You know, we've become so good, Janine, at elective endoscopy now, at, at, at onco-resection, at ERCP, at EUS. We've become so good at this, but we haven't, unfortunately, collectively as an endoscopy community, improved in hemostasis um, because it's not an elective thing. It's still something that's done indifferently. And so um, the, the there is an algorithm for this, you know, and, and as as she touched on, you know, depending on your lesion, it will define what your therapy should be, whether that's, you know, injection therapy and hemospray, mechanical therapy or hemospray. But um, I, yes, we use it in rescue bleeding, but I certainly would not market hemospray as when all, all else fails. And, and the, the, the simple answer for that is go to PubMed and look at the data. You know, there, there's thousands of patients that have been treated as, as primary therapy and it's, it's worked very well. And so how much um, spray do we need? When can you stop spraying? You, 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 you can't, I, I've never yet seen anyone empty a canister, uh, Janine, of, of hemospray. I, I still will tell an anecdote just to lighten the audience um, whilst they're, they're having their dinner. The very first time we had hemospray uh, in our unit, one of my colleagues uh, had an acute GI bleed and uh, you know, it was on a need to use basis. So, you know, he called me and I said, please go ahead and use it. And then I went into the room 30 minutes later and it was like Christmas because they were on their third canister of hemospray and they hadn't quite figured out how to use it. And there was just hemospray everywhere. Unfortunately, it wasn't on the peptic ulcer. So, you know, look, I, I would say that, you know, between five to 10 applications is, 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 is more, than, more than appropriate, but you will struggle to finish a canister. And, and do you have a preference, either hemospray or one of the other uh, clotting agents? Are there comparative data? 
There, there isn't any, uh, there, as far as I'm aware, you know, Purostat has been studied mostly in the post-therapeutic st uh, to, to, to reduce post-therapy rebleeding. Uh, there, there isn't really much perspective data on, on next powder. Um, so there isn't comparative. I mean, we, we use hemospray simply because we've got the most experience with it. Um, and, you know, it, it all comes down to just making the right decisions early on and making an informed decision. You can tell with a bleed pretty early on which way this is going to go. If you have the skills to deal with it, deal with it. If you don't, then use your hemospray and get someone else to do it when the sun shines. And there's also another one regarding the hemospray. Can you make a perforation if you have a deep ulcer? Um, so the answer to your question is, uh, I don't believe that that has happened or can happen. Uh, I don't know the exact pressure with which the powder comes out of the spray canister, but um, you know, I can imagine a thin walled posterior duodenal ulcer that, that, that is a possibility. You know, I've perforated patients in the duodenal wall with, with thermocoagulation before, um, but I'm not aware of any, any documented data of, of, of that having been done with hemospray. So then, of course, also still a question for the clipping. Shu, are there any other clips around of which you would say you can use them as well? Or is your choice fixed and determined? You mean uh, through, the clip, uh, through the scope clipping device, right? Yeah. So uh, in the past 10 years, I, I pretty much just uh, used uh, instant clips. And the right now, instant plus. I know in the States, there are um, Boston Scientific uh, uh, Resolution 360 and the Olympus Quick Clip. Uh, I don't know, Pro, I think of the generation. And there's also, I think, a, a lesser play of uh, Microtech and be marketed by another American company. And uh, I have not tried others, so I cannot really compare, uh, give you a sort of a comparison experience, but I've been very uh, satisfied with uh, the 60 millimeter instant uh, clips now plus especially with the uh, much improved agility, rotation. Uh, I mentioned earlier in my talk, I cannot ask more. So I, you know, uh, uh, well, and especially I work in the university setting. And uh, so that's a, as long as we're happy, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're fine, so. I really like your balanced answer that there are also other clips around, but that you did not really try them and that there are not that many comparative data. Um, I'm going to check what other nice questions are around. Can, can I, can I, sorry to interject. Can I, do you mind if I just step on, on in, into Shu's uh, uh, um, talk Shoes. about clipping? So the, um, you know, through the scope clips have evolved tremendously, you know, as, as, as we saw in the presentation. But um, I think where we will see a massive change in mechanical therapy and peptic ulcer bleeding uh, in the next five years will be over the scope mechanical devices. Uh, we're doing some prospective data at the moment. You know, the post, the, the duodenal bulb is a difficult place to place um, conventional endoclips. We, we've all tried and, you know, the anatomy is distorted uh, and, uh, you know, there is some, some, some uh, non-randomized data on the Avesco through the scope clip. Um, and, you know, having used it, uh, several times, it, it is a real get out of jail clip for, for difficult uh, GI bleeds, especially in the duodenum. So I think we'll see this space grow. So that's a, a nice look into the future. And now I'm going to go back a bit on more the basics. What do we do with the PPI uh, if we have a patient with an upper GI bleed? Do we start them automatically or in specific cases? Shu, what would you do? I think... Uh... Uh, I don't know about European guideline and the SG guideline said every patient coming with upper GI bleeding suspected, you should start with a PPI if you have a liver disease and arteriotide as well. That's always part of the guideline. And uh, so despite endoscopic uh, treatment, examination treatment, patients should be uh, maintained, uh, provided and maintained on PPI because even you stop bleeding, you need a tissue to heal. And the study have shown the uh, gastric acidity really interfere with the tissue healing and uh, uh, leading to persistent ulceration. I remember, uh, I think 20 years, 20, uh, 10 or 20 years ago, there was a study, randomized study from India. The, the randomized patient was suspected of GI bleeding 
after excluding various seal, suspect various seal pathology. So PPI alone without endoscopy to therapeutic endoscopy with possible endoscopic intervention. And the study showed actually, to our surprise, PPI work very close to endoscopy. So that just show with the, uh, the PPI the, uh, is really very effective. And uh, so right now, a lot of time we see a patient with uh, upper GI bleeding, and uh, if they're old, they're fragile, they're the significant comorbidities, and uh, especially you're not suspecting anything too severe. And uh, sometimes conservative management or PPI uh, should be considered. And of course, you need to discuss with the patient, with the team to, uh, to address this. And so I think it's the same as in the European guidelines that we uh, should start PPI. It's, uh, it's, it's working very well and it's, I would say safe. Still, there are tons of questions. I think we as panel could try still to uh, answer some of them uh, offline. But here for online, uh, if you have still a burning remark, Shu or Rayan, please go ahead. Otherwise, I'm going to round up. I'm gonna just. I'm gonna be uh, uh, slightly uh, uh, um, uh, confrontational with both of you and say that I'm a non-believer with PPIs. I, I think that you know, based on one randomized control trial, uh, you know, 23 years ago, uh, societal guidance has said that high-risk stigmata, you know, warranted 72-hour PPI transfusion. I think we massively overtreat these patients, and I would, you know, challenge you to show me the data where. Stabling gastric, stabilizing gastric pH reduces rebleeding. I, I'm a non-believer. We do it, but I, I think we massively overtreat patients with PPIs in this setting. But anyway, yeah. But I like that you try to poke everybody to get thinking again and check also what's the evidence behind. I think that's often in our profession. Um, there's no high quality of evidence, or there's just one or two randomized control trials. I'm happy that you say so. That means we can still do lots and lots of research. And I think we both are, we are actually all not at the uh, time to get to our pension. So happy <laughs> to doubt about the PPIs, um, implying lots of new research, probably also so to some of the listeners. We have still uh, 400 uh, people uh, staying with us, but still it's 10 past eight by now. And I would like to start to round up the session. So maybe we can get to the closing slides. So I would like to thank Cook Medical for supporting us, for making it possible that all of you could, uh, could have a look at this uh, great webinar. Of course, also big thanks to the ESG governing board for um, giving us this opportunity and also the platform. And the platform is made possible by David and Gabriella, for which also a big thanks. Not to forget that we will have a very exciting ESGA days in 2022. It will be hybrid, but I very much hope to see you all in Prague. Seeing and talking to each other live is still, in my opinion, far much more fun than having you uh, hybrid. But if there are no other possibilities, then we do see you back on this platform. And then not to forget what are the advantages if you become a member of the ESGE. Uh, among others, you can use the My ESGE tutorial where you can check your knowledge and widen your knowledge, but also you can check tons and tons of guidelines, which I think are quite up to date and there's a lots of things to know from. And then the next webinar, November 10th, and it will be about the lower GI bleeds. So we hope to see you all back there. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Janine. Thank you very much, Janine.